Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors that may be at work in the Schuyler niece case. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the timeline of the crime, then I'll move to the mental health and personality factors. I'll also look at various theories of the crime, like what may have motivated the perpetrators in this case. Starting with the timeline of the crime, we go to July 6, 2012, in Star City, West Virginia. It's about 12.30 a.m. We see 16-year-old Skylar Niece opens her bedroom window in the apartment where she lives with her parents and climbs out. She closed the window, but not all the way. She left it open about an inch. A window screen was found in the closet the next morning. We also see there was a bench position not far from the window outside. So it looked like she was intending to climb back in. So she wasn't leaving permanently. She was just sneaking out with the intent of coming back. She walked across the street and climbed into the back seat of a car that was waiting there. In the vehicle, there were two other teenage girls, Sheila Eddy and Rachel Schoff. They were both 16 years old as well. Sheila and Rachel had concealed knives on their person and a number of items in the trunk, including bleach, paper towels, a shovel, and clean clothes. The vehicle was driven across the state line into Pennsylvania, specifically the town of Brave, where all three girls would occasionally use cannabis. After the girls exited the car, Skylar was told that they forgot to bring a lighter. She said she would go back to the car to get her lighter. As she turned around, Sheila and Rachel started counting to three. This was arranged in advance to regulate the timing of their attack. After counting to three, they started stabbing her. She tried to escape, but only made it a short distance before Rachel tackled her and continued to stab her. During the attack, Skylar managed to gain possession of the knife that Rachel was using, and Skylar cut Rachel's leg. But ultimately, the assault proved fatal as Sheila continued to stab Skylar as well. The perpetrators had stabbed Skylar more than 50 times. They planned to bury Skylar's body next to the road, but when they attempted to dig a hole there, they were unable to penetrate the soil. Therefore, they covered the body with dirt, rocks, and tree branches. The perpetrators made extensive efforts to destroy evidence at the crime scene before driving back to their homes. Initially, the police thought that Skylar had run away. They found their surveillance video and saw that a car had picked Skylar up, but at that point, they did not know that car belonged to Sheila Eddy. Sheila told Skylar's parents that she picked Skylar up that night, saying that Rachel Schoff was also with her, and the three had gone driving around Star City, West Virginia, getting high on cannabis. After an hour, Skylar was dropped off safely. Sheila said that Skylar insisted that she was dropped off down the street so that Sheila's car would not wake anybody up. So I guess this was to explain why the car didn't appear on the surveillance video a second time. So again, at this point, the police think that the car in their surveillance video doesn't belong to Sheila Eddy. They think it was somebody else. They think that Skylar came back from being with Sheila and Rachel and then went back out again in somebody else's vehicle. Sometime after this, she must have gone missing. Something must have happened after that point. Police went through various surveillance videos recorded in Star City and found a video showing Sheila's car headed out of the city on July 6, even though the perpetrators claim they never left the city. Cell phone towers also placed them near Blacksville, West Virginia, which is relatively close to Brave, Pennsylvania. When they asked Sheila why her story didn't match the evidence, she said that she forgot that they traveled to that area. She claimed that only she and Rachel made that trip, but Rachel told the police that all three of them went to Blacksville, Pennsylvania. So we see their stories start to diverge. Both perpetrators agreed to take polygraphs. Sheila took one and failed. Whatever that means, polygraphs aren't scientific. They're pseudoscientific nonsense. But they can convince a perpetrator that the police know something that they don't. So they're really a tool of manipulation by the police. Rachel, however, jumped out of her father's car on the way to take the polygraph. The car was still moving at that time. So I guess it's a good thing their dad wasn't taking her to the police station in an airplane. Apparently, she had just watched the short documentary, How to Sustain a Head Injury and Look Guilty in One Easy Step. 
Now, after this incident, it became common knowledge that Sheila and Rachel were lying about something, and some people believed that they may have been responsible for Skylar's disappearance, but many people really just thought that they were hiding something that could be helpful, like they were being less than honest, but not that they had committed a homicide. The perpetrators started to feel a substantial amount of social pressure to come clean. About six months after the murder, Rachel has what was referred to as a nervous breakdown. She was out of control and screaming, running up and down the street. Her mother called emergency services. She then assaulted her mother. Rachel was admitted to a mental hospital, released, and taken directly to the police station. There's no information about what happened in that mental hospital, but one could imagine that she must have confessed or otherwise implicated herself in the crime. Normally, when somebody gets out of a mental hospital, they don't go directly to a police station. On January 3, 2013, Rachel Schoff confessed to conspiring with Sheila Eddy to murder Skylar Niece. She said that the pair plotted the murder in science class. When I first saw this report, it made it sound like they did this as part of science class, and I was thinking that that school might want to revise their curriculum a bit. That seems a little bit dangerous. Rachel told the police that they murdered Skylar because they didn't like her, and they didn't want to be friends with her anymore. She led the police to the location of Skylar's body, which was about 30 miles away from Skylar's apartment. Her body was identified on January 16, 2013. Now, the police said that they didn't arrest Rachel immediately because all they had was that confession, and that was not enough. A confession is usually enough to make an arrest. I think they released her because they didn't want to tip off Sheila. My guess is they felt pretty safe that Rachel was not able or willing to flee the area. So keeping the information from Sheila was worth the risk that Rachel would go on the run. The police put a wire on Rachel, hoping to catch Sheila saying something inculpatory, but Sheila did not. The police then found Skylar's blood in Sheila's car, a fairly significant bit of evidence. The police arrested Sheila in the parking lot of a Cracker Barrel restaurant. She was there with her mother. Sheila was worried about how her hair looked during the arrest, and she thought a lot of cameras would be filming her arrest, but of course they were not. Rachel would plead guilty to second-degree murder in May of 2013, and she was sentenced to 30 years in prison in 2014, but she is eligible for parole in just 10 years. Interestingly, the state only asked for 20 years as part of that plea agreement, so the judge added 10 more years above the recommendation. Sheila was indicted by a grand jury in September of 2013. She was charged with first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and kidnapping. She initially pleaded not guilty, but in January of 2014, she pleaded guilty to first-degree murder. Her sentence was life in prison with mercy, meaning she would be eligible for parole in just 15 years. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors. There's really no mental health information available. None has been released in this case, as far as I know. Both murderers were assessed, though, as part of the criminal proceedings. So perhaps in the future, some information about their mental health will be released. There's not a lot to go on other than the fact that they committed murder. We see the social media posts, the videos of them being sentenced, observations from the police, and the reports of friends and family. All three girls were only children. We know that Skylar met Sheila when both of them were just eight years old, and Rachel came along when the pair was in high school. At that point, the three became close friends. It appears as though at some point, Skylar was being pushed out of the trio by Sheila and Rachel. Weeks before the murder, Skylar posted acrimonious messages on social media indicating a lack of trust for the pair. We see this video of Sheila asking Rachel and Skylar how they would prefer to die. She talks about suffocation, a gunshot wound, drowning. Perhaps here we see a fascination with death, which could speak to a possible motive. Skylar had recorded in her diary that she encountered Sheila and Rachel having sex. Some believe this could have been a motive, like Sheila and Rachel didn't want that information getting out. After she went to prison, Rachel married a fellow inmate, who, of course, is female. It's not a stretch to imagine that Sheila and Rachel could have had some type of romantic interaction. Not long before the murder, Skylar posted something to the effect of, I'll tell the whole school the material I have on everyone, which is a lot. And she also posted, just know, I know. Now, investigators describe Sheila as arrogant, narcissistic, calm, and wrong. Not exactly sure what they meant by the word wrong. 
Rachel was described as being nervous and remorseful. So this brings us to the question, why did Sheila Eddy and Rachel Schoff kill Skylar Neese? Without any mental health information, it's difficult to know what could have motivated them. This crime is confusing, though, because we see two 16-year-old girls murdering another 16-year-old girl. Statistically, this is an extremely rare form of homicide. I will go through the major theories of this crime and give my thoughts on each one. An important element to consider in this crime is that I don't think that either one of them would have committed homicide alone. For example, after the murder, Rachel became a liability for Sheila. But as far as I know, Sheila didn't make any plans to kill Rachel. She would have had a fairly strong motive to do so, considering she was facing life in prison for the murder of Skylar Nice. So there's something about the two of them together. It's the combination that somehow led to this crime. With that in mind, let's take a look at the first theory. This first theory says that Sheila and Rachel were romantically involved. Skylar discovered this, and they killed her so she would not reveal their secret. I don't think this is what happened, and here's why. It's not clear that they would have really cared about this information being public. They liked attention, and any kind of attention probably would have satisfied them. They planned their crime well in advance. If they were worried that Skylar was going to release this information, they would have wanted to act quickly. It would have been an exigent circumstance, not a situation where they could wait weeks or months to carry out the attack. Skylar went with the pair voluntarily, so they were still on speaking terms. There was still some room for negotiation. If they really did have this concern about their secret, they almost certainly could have come to some other arrangement to secure Skylar's silence. Then there's this argument about their use of knives. There's this idea that when a murderer selects a knife, they're doing so because committing murder with a knife is more intimate, more indicative of a killing born out of rage. But the reason they used knives was because they didn't know how to operate a firearm. So it was just a matter of practicality from their point of view. They were just looking for some way to kill Skylar. The method wasn't particularly important to them. Now moving to the second theory. This theory is based on the idea of Foley Adu, otherwise known as shared psychosis, like we saw with the Slenderman case that I covered in a prior video. So the idea here is that one of the individuals is psychotic and the other one becomes psychotic because they're exposed to them. So they work as a pair in this delusional state and they can commit various crimes, including homicide. This would explain a lot. It explains how they were able to commit the crime in a way that was consistent with what we see with other similar crimes in involving teenage female perpetrators. Although in the Slenderman case, the offenders were younger than what we see here. They were 12 years old. The difficulty with this theory is that without any mental health information, there's no way to know if either one of them had any type of psychosis. They both functioned quite well in school and with their families. There really isn't any evidence of psychosis other than that their crime was similar to other crimes where psychosis had been involved. Now, if Sheila was experiencing some type of psychosis, and again, there's no indication she was, it could explain why Rachel was callous and calm, but then appeared to have some type of emotional dysregulation about six months later. In the case of shared psychosis, we see that when the perpetrators are separated, the one who is not psychotic to start with often returns back to a non-psychotic state. Overall, the second theory, Foley Adu, is interesting, but because it's dependent on having a psychotic person in the pair to start with, I don't think it's a great explanation in this case. This takes me to the third theory. This theory says that Sheila and Rachel committed murder because they were sensation-seeking. They wanted the thrill of committing homicide. With this theory, we would see that both Sheila and Rachel would probably have some morbid fascination with death, which does seem possible based on that video I talked about before. They would also have to be somewhat callous, cold, and sadistic. If we think about the nature of this crime, it's really unbelievable that they followed through with it. This is such a rare type of crime. It's one thing to think about it, talk about it, fantasize about it. It's another thing to actually construct a plan and follow through with that plan. Both of them were actively involved in stabbing Skylar to death. There is this sense from the nature of this murder that these two were really disconnected from any empathy, not just in the moment, but even 
afterward. This theory is also consistent with narcissism, as this construct is tied to psychopathy. Again, we have reports that Sheila was narcissistic. It seems reasonable to believe that both of them were, to some degree. Now, what about psychopathy specifically? Narcissism and psychopathy are separate constructs, even if they overlap somewhat. Well, this is where it gets tough. According to friends and family, neither Sheila nor Rachel demonstrated symptoms of psychopathy. They were not in trouble frequently, although they did get in trouble sometimes. They drank, they used substances, and they missed school. So there was some evidence of psychopathic tendencies. Now, some have reported that Sheila was a bit of a troublemaker. So again, we see some behavior that was not consistent with social norms, but it didn't really seem to be extreme. They weren't committing burglaries, stealing cars, assaulting people. These were crimes where they were just doing what they wanted to do to have fun. Doesn't make it right, but it's much different than murder. Now, interestingly, there is evidence that they brazenly talked about killing Skylar in school before the murder. They talked about disposing of her body as well. And this information made its way back to Skylar, but she didn't take it seriously. Now, these are the type of things that kids say on a regular basis in school, talking about morbid topics. But still, this might show a lack of awareness. They were talking about committing a homicide where other people could hear them or overhear them, and they didn't really seem too disturbed about that. It was like it was a joke to them. So, yes, there could have been some psychopathy going on, and it makes sense that there would have been when people commit this type of crime. It could be that both of them were manipulative and demonstrated pathological lying. They seem to do that both before and after the murders. For example, we see that Sheila maintained a dialogue with Skylar's family immediately after the murder and pretended to be concerned about what happened to Skylar. So with this in mind, it could be that they manifested superficial charm and manipulative tendencies more so than the other obvious characteristics of psychopathy like being irresponsible, impulsive, and having behavioral problems. Although again, in looking at this case, it does appear that they were irresponsible, impulsive, and they did have some behavioral problems. So it appears as though they may have been able to hide the primary and secondary psychopathic characteristics. So the manipulation is hidden by virtue of somebody being manipulative, and the other characteristics were hidden because perhaps people weren't watching too closely or didn't care what they were doing. Now, both Sheila and Rachel appear to have extremely high extroversion and extremely low neuroticism, right? So we see that they were interested in drama, interested in being visible. They weren't afraid of being seen by a lot of people, perhaps even not afraid of making a scene. And of course, they were extremely calm before, during, and after the murder. This particular profile, being high in extroversion, and low in neuroticism is a fairly dangerous profile when it mixes with criminality, right? So not everybody who's extroverted and low in neuroticism will become a criminal, but when they do, it's a dangerous combination. Now, primary psychopathic killers tend to plan their crimes more carefully. They're more aware of police tactics and they're incredibly calm through every phase of criminal acts. So they were able to function like primary psychopaths, even though Again, there may have been characteristics from both primary and secondary psychopathy evident. With all that in mind, I think the third theory is the most likely, but we really need more information about their mental health to have a reasonable degree of certainty with any of these theories. It could come out that there's some type of psychosis or some type of depression or something that we don't know about that could really alter how these theories would be put together. Now, the next question is, was this crime preventable? Interestingly, I would say that it probably was not preventable. 16-year-old females are rarely involved in homicide. There was really no way to see this coming. I think the fact that they talked about the murder and disposing of Skylar's body in school is disturbing and should have been taken seriously. But again, 16-year-olds would be prone to do something like that. It's not that unusual. And if we investigated every time something like that happened with a huge amount of resources, like if we spent a lot of money to chase down all those type of comments, we'd be spending a lot of time chasing 
a very low risk event, right? Something that probably was not going to happen, except in very rare cases. So I don't really think it was preventable. The last question I'll talk about here is the sentence. A lot of people are upset that Rachel could be released in 10 years and Sheila could be released in 15 years. I don't think it's likely they'll be released that early, but I think it is certainly possible that Rachel could get out in around 20 years and Sheila could get out in 25 to 30 years. I think the problem with these types of sentences is that the way that these girls are now might not be how they are in the future. They could develop a lot more remorse, although it appears as though Rachel has some level, but they could develop a lot more being in prison for 20 years, and they could also develop insight into their behavior. We could see a completely different picture in that amount of time. So I think to answer the question, is the sentence fair? I think they should spend at least 20, maybe 25 years in prison. I think that gives them plenty of time to develop insight and to ensure that that behavior wouldn't occur if they were released. I think getting out in 10 or 15 is way too soon. Now, of course, the sentences were for Rachel, 30 years, and for Sheila, life in prison. So if they end up doing all the time, I think that would be more reasonable. But I do think there should be a path for them to be released. And I think the parole board should seriously considering it, depending on the type of progress that these girls make in prison. I think it's easy to say when somebody commits a heinous crime like this, oh, throw them in prison forever. Life sentences are not a good deterrent, so somebody's not going to look at that and think they shouldn't do the same thing necessarily. And of course, life sentences leave no room for rehabilitation, right? And I think that's really a problem in this case. Again, you have 16-year-old offenders. Rehabilitation really needs to be an option. I think society has to be open to that happening. It doesn't mean they will be rehabilitated. I just think that it needs to be an option, right? So I'm open to them serving an extremely long sentence, 30 years, and life in prison for Rachel and Sheila, respectively. But I'm also open to the idea that they rehabilitate, gain insight, and are released and become at least somewhat productive members of society. That's a long way off, though. There's a lot that has to happen between now and any potential release date. Society should ask for a lot of progress in the time that those two have in prison. Those are my thoughts on the Skyler Niece murder. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.